timing. I pray you will be with the preaching of thy word tonight, Lord, and all we do, the Bible being memorized, the singing, any testimonies, and we do pray you will bless what we do. We thank you for the preserved Bible, and as mentioned, we thank you for your timing. Now help us understand, in Jesus' name, amen. Now in our marriage series, we are taking a few weeks to deal with a question, why she isn't married? Why she isn't married? First week we did propaganda. She doesn't want to be, or at least she thinks she doesn't want to be. Today we're going to answer by a second reason, and that is God's timing. Perhaps God's timing. We've seen our text is in 1 Timothy 5, 14. Paul says, I will therefore, the Holy Ghost says, I will therefore that the younger women marry, bear children, guide the house, give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully, for some are already turned aside after Satan. We saw in this same epistle, he made the same point, that there will be a type of salvation in the marriage life. Of a Christian woman. We studied the reasons why the statement younger women applies not to just widows, but to all women. We also showed that there are some that have not been called to be married, that are gifted to be celibate their whole lives, to be able to serve God in a different way. Not through the family unit, not through the husband, but through the Single life. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7, To avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. For I would that all men were even as myself, but every man has his proper gift of God. Imagine people writing and saying, I'm offended at your message. I don't need a man. I don't need to be married. Maybe you don't. My question is this. Have you been faithful? Have you been pure your whole life? There are many falling into the propaganda of the feminists. And that's why we discuss this foundational reason that they are suppressing an inner natural desire that's against nature. They're led to not marry out of fear, out of propaganda, a high-dollar propaganda, a propaganda that is rooted in seducing satanic spirits who command you not to marry. And they speak through the philosophies of feminism, communism, the sexual revolution. What was the end result? Disease? Children born out of wedlock? Baby murder. I just looked at an article headline uh, just a few hours ago. Teens who live with only one of their parents are more likely to show delinquent behaviors, even if there is a step-parent in the home, a new study says. Imagine having a divided family. Imagine having a situation where people are having babies and not even getting married. That's a satanic philosophy. We talked about that. So we have now Hollywood, inspired by devils, mocking marriage. You have magazines everywhere, making a single independent life look fun. Your key to happiness. And multitudes are being led to live a life that they are not called to live. Not able to live, not gifted to live. And many, as we said, have ended up in sin. 
They want men in their lives in romantic or physical relationships, but without holy matrimony. That's not an option. That is not an option. The Bible says God will judge that. For many others who obeyed the feminist, they later often realize they've been sold a rotten bill of goods. They were scammed. And we spent last week quoting a few of these older feminists in later years who explained how they were tricked, how they were deceived, and they counsel you not to follow their generation. We heard from their testimonies that deep inside, even when they were young, they knew they were suppressing something out of peer pressure. So I say, choose your friends wisely. Choose what you listen to and watch and read very wisely. We showed one of the writers of one of those wicked feminist magazines confessed to how she wrote lying propaganda to make it seem like everybody's doing it the way they want it to be done. And she says it's all a scam. We showed all that. I'm not going to repeat it. I, I'm, I'm saying all of this and reminding you to bring you to the point that the grass always seems greener on the other side, doesn't it? It's not hard to go to a mother changing diapers, washing clothes, a beautiful life with her children, seeing the, the, the first time the child walks, seeing all these beautiful things, uh, uh, taking care of her husband. And uh, it's easy, though, to get in a situation where the grass looks greener. I have a couple of horses that it always looks greener somewhere else in some other field. Then I've got other horses that, hey, this grass is fine. It's fine right here. So the devil's always going to come and try to make you think the grass is greener. And a lot of times, as I've said before, it is greener by the septic tank where there's sewer. Not the green you want. It's a stinky life. So sometimes you jump ship and end up in, in a situation you don't want to be in. This is what the devil did to the first woman. He deceived her, remember? She was in paradise. No ticks, no mosquitoes. Temperature, weather was perfect. How did the devil make her feel like she was miserable? He even convinced her that her father was abusive. That you're missing out on the good life. You're in a prison. You are being kept back from your full potential. We've discussed before in the 1950s, many women after the war returned back to their homes and they loved it. They were happy being homemakers. And this was a horrible panic attack to the Marxists trying to destroy this country. So they raised up in the 60s, Betty Friedan, and she wrote a book called The Feminine Mystique. And she said, you women that are married, it's all a lie. You're not happy being married. You want to be down here at Bilo or Piggly Wiggly. And, and, and you want to be down here working. This is what you want to do. You don't want to be working in your home. You don't want to be uh, uh, fulfilling that type of prison and horrible life. And many women fell for this lie. It's so easy, ever since Eve fell, ever since Dinah was curious about the grass on the other side, uh, to see the daughters of the Lamb, it's very easy for the devil to come to you and say, you're miserable. I'm going to tell you what, I've had a lot of people, years, years, and years later, look back and say, you know, when I thought I was miserable, I wasn't miserable. Those are the happiest times of my life. Wow, I saw what misery really was. Remember the words of the woman who put on the attire of a harlot and she was loud and stubborn and her feet abided not in her home. She sinned against her husband when he had to go on a long journey. And she said to her wicked accomplice, Proverbs 7, let us solace ourselves with love. The word solace implies that you need to be comforted because you're miserable. There's pain. 
you're not happy. You're not going to be happy without this sin. That's what she's saying. That's what the devil's telling you. You've got to do things the worldly way or you won't be happy. Instead of learning to be content, this is the lie she gives him. You're missing out. It says in Proverbs 9, a foolish woman is clamorous, loud. She is simple and knoweth nothing. As for him that wanteth understanding, she saith to him, stolen waters are sweet. There's something about the sinful life. But we know Proverbs 20 says, bread of deceit is sweet to a man, but afterwards his mouth shall be filled with gravel. It's that afterwards you better watch out for. So many women said, no, I'm not going to get married. I'm going to sow my wild oats and get out here and live life for me. They fell into great sin. They reaped a whirlwind. And time begins to fly by. And one day they wake up and say, you know what? I want to get married. But many times their youthful beauty is gone. And many of the best men are gone. Just yesterday, I believe it was, Dennis Prager, a Jew, not even a Christian, but he hates the left. He hates liberalism. <laughs> he hates this feminism. I'll give him that. He said, as I have documented on a number of occasions, the left ruins everything it touches. There is no exception. And nowhere is this damage more evident or tragic than with regard to women. For all of recorded history, virtually all women sought a man with whom to bond. Then along came modern left-wing feminism, which communicated to generations of young women through almost every influence in their lives, most especially teachers and the media, that a woman doesn't need a man. As a result of that, a smaller percentage of American women are now marrying than ever before. Women who have children without ever marrying and producing a highly disproportionate percentage of social misfits. But many women who never give birth nor marry also constitute a societal problem. They are more likely to be angry and to express that anger in support of radical causes that undermine society. And he goes on to document. He's saying because they should be married, they end up loud and clamorous and end up using their voting rights in America uh, and, and all of their influence to support they just fall for Marxism and all kinds of isms and things that uh, are cursing our country. It's something about getting married for many of these women that causes them to not have those temptations and deceptions. And Paul goes through that type of thing and explains. So you better heed the warning and command to avoid fornication, avoid Satan's trick, and uh, as God opens the door, get married in the Lord. On the other hand, it's not always that a woman has been deceived. Or to say it better, it's not always that she is unmarried due to the fact that she doesn't desire to be. You just go Google and type in God's timing uh want to be married, and uh, it's, it's everywhere. I mean, everybody's writing about it. So there are some women out there that have not, Christian women, that have not fallen for the propaganda. They really want to get married. So we're going to explore some of the reasons they want to get married. They have not been tricked by the feminists. Why aren't they able to get married? And we're going to start with this reason right now, God's timing. God's timing. I don't want you to think that is the only reason. But it is one reason. See, there are some women that are saved that have a reason to believe that they are not called to singlehood.
And there are some serious reasons why these women aren't able to get married. We want to examine them and we want to do it in order. First reason is she has no desire because of propaganda. The next reason is she has the desire. But in the mystery of God's sovereign providence, it is not his time. Say, well, why? I don't know. We don't always know the answer to that. Sometimes it's because God wants you to suffer. I don't understand why. We see through a glass darkly and we pray, Lord, we don't understand why there's some suffering for good people. Now, he gives you some reasons. He's working patience in us. Sometimes he wants you, like in the case of Job, to be a testimony for somebody else. God has his reasons. The same reason there's other suffering in the lives of good people. One way some may suffer is something that they greatly desire. And pray for, for some reason known to God, is being withheld. But I want to say something right here. Do not presume it is not God's time. In other words, God's timing is often a go-to excuse to cover, to cover other serious problems that should be addressed. All throughout the history of Christianity and God's people, well, it's just not God's time. Sometimes things are God's time, but there's other reasons that you have to look at. So what I'm saying is when you go, that, that's why I put a question mark here. The second reason we're dealing with is it's not God's time. But the question mark just means test that. Test that. Don't just assume. And that's why we're going to explore other reasons to try to sort out some problems today. You remember Haggai. It said, Haggai 1, 2, thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, this people say, God's saying this, this people say, the time is not come, that the time that the Lord's house should be built. God said, go rebuild the temple. You're free. You've got authority. You're not in captivity anymore. The Persians have given you the right to go build. And God's people said, it's not God's time right now. Because the doors aren't open. It would require some money and some time and some effort. And we don't know how to do it. I mean, I, we got some opposition here. Then came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet saying, Is it time for you, O ye, to dwell in your sealed houses? Pretty luxurious houses you have. And this house lie waste. Now therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. You looked for much, and lo, it came to little. And when you brought it home, I did blow upon it. Always something comes up. Every time they get a paycheck, now something else breaks. Oh, now we're going to be able to get ahead. Something else breaks. That's not, that, some of that's just life. But some of it's a curse of God trying to get our attention. God says, I blew on it. Every time you got in your pocket, I blew on it. Why, saith the Lord of hosts? Because of my house that is waste. And you run every man to his own house. I called for a drought, says God. He says, there's all kinds of ways I've been cursing you. You don't even know you're cursed. You didn't like realize? Why don't you consider what's going on here? Things aren't really working out. They're not working out because you're not putting me and my house first. What we just learned was sometimes we say it's not God's time when really it's just laziness. 
Sometimes we say it's not God's time because we're making excuses. It's an old trick of the enemy in your flesh to blame God for our own lack of responsibility in certain areas. So all I'm saying Sometimes, if you're called to marriage, sometimes saying it's not God's time is an excuse for some deeper problems and deeper issues that need to be addressed. But we're not dealing with that today. There are times when you may be desiring to be married. You might be ready to be married. You might be very responsible and very holy and very godly in your Christian life. Or you feel that you are. But God hasn't opened the door. And the question is why? Let's explore some of these reasons why God has not opened the door. Maybe it'll be a reason that God will reveal later to you and you'll look back on it and you say, now I see. Now I see why he had me get married a little later. There's an old country song. It's from a man's point of view, but you could see it from the woman's point of view as well. It's a pop country song, so there's some lack of reverence in it and things that... uh, I'm I'm not giving you this song as something to go praise and rejoice in, but what I do want you to understand is it's very, very sad when the world out here can have light or a depth of understanding that it seems like many Christians in dedicated fundamental churches don't even have that degree of depth. He starts the song out by saying that he and his wife were out and they met a woman that before he was married, he used to pray to God to give her to him as a wife. And the song says, she was the one that I wanted for all times. And each night I'd spend praying that God would make her mine. And if he'd only grant me this wish that I wish back then, I'd never ask for anything again. And then the song gets to the chorus. Sometimes I thank God for unanswered prayers. Just because he doesn't answer doesn't mean he don't care. Some of God's greatest gifts are unanswered prayers. And looking now with the wife that God gave him and looking back at the mistake he was about to make, he says, God, thank you for not answering my prayer. So what are we trying to say? We're trying to say sometimes you are not in the right place to make a right judgment. And sometimes God withholds until a later time because He has something right for you. He says, she was the one that I'd wanted for all times. Uh, I'm sorry, He says, uh, she wasn't quite the angel that I remembered in my dreams. And as she walked away, I looked at my wife, and then and there I thanked the good Lord For the gifts in my life, sometimes I thank God for unanswered prayers. How much more should dedicated Christian, if a pop country song can have that much life, why can't we walk around as dedicated Baptists? How come you can't walk around and say, God, sometimes you're not answering my prayers because you are trying to help me. Sometimes we think we know what we want. God may be preparing somebody for you, and there may be reasons why it cannot be at the present moment. Maybe there's some obvious ones. Maybe you aren't ready spiritually. See, we've lost a lot in this generation. We've lost basic manners. We've lost the basic training that's supposed to be from the time you're a toddler to make you able to exist with somebody else. You understand? 
People said, oh, I'm just going to let my kid just be raised. I'm never going to put them through it. I'm never going to train them about anything. Imagine being a football player and never getting trained. Imagine being an army soldier. Imagine being anything and not having any training. Here's a plane. Go fly it. No, you need training. You're supposed to have training for life. But kids are just left to just whatever they want to do. No training. Never having their will. Under submission, never learning to get rid of their selfishness. Maybe you need to grow so you can recognize what a holy man is. Now, I'm not saying you're not able to recognize that right now. I'm just saying this is something you need to check out. Because it's not just this church that I'm preaching to, see. Primarily to you. See, sometimes there are people that don't have any idea what a good man is. They think they know. But God's being very kind to you. Because your eyes and ears have been in the wrong place. And you have the wrong idea of what a handsome man is. You have the wrong idea of what a good man is. You have the wrong idea of what a man is. And God in his kindness might be working on you to bring you to a place so you can appreciate the gift that he has for you. Some people go out here and get married. We had an older sister uh, that spoke to the younger ladies one time many years ago. And she explained, I regretted walking out on a good man. I look back and realize I had a good husband. I didn't think he was a good husband at the time. But looking back, I realized I had a good, faithful man. I had a man. And she says, sisters, don't make the mistake that I made. So maybe the Lord's trying to do a work in you on the potter's wheel. He's got some things he's chipping away so you can be ready for his gift. Same with the men. Maybe there's some stubbornness. Oh, maybe there's some worldly thinking. Maybe there's some immaturities and he's got to chip away that stuff or it's going to be a nightmare to be married to. You know, God said in the Bible that when an odious woman gets married, that that's why the whole earth is disquieted and in the mess it is. He gave four major reasons why this earth is in the way that it is. And one of the reasons he said, when a woman gets married, And she's got some issues. She's stubborn and contentious and doesn't follow authority. And if you tell her to do something, she'll just do the opposite. Just because you told her. It's not just a husband that she'll be laid. She's like that with any authority. Hey, go do that. I'm not going to do it just because you told me to. Woo, young lady, you've got some issues. Boy, you're going to have a problem. So God is trying to get you to a place so you will appreciate the treasures that he has for you in life. You know, a lot of times we pray for the wrong things. We think something over there is going to make us happy, but it's not the thing you need. See, we need to pray through a renewed heart, a renewed way of thinking. You may be wanting something that really doesn't exist. You say, I don't like that. I want that rebellious fellow over there. He's worldly. Look at that. I like that worldly fella. Yeah. Really? You think it's nice to be worldly? You think it's a good thing to be worldly? You think he's a manly man because he's worldly? He's a punk. So all the dudes, all the older men around your church say, that's a punk. You are attracted to a punk. That's not a man.
But you think that something will make you happy. But you say, no, wait a second. I, I, I want him to be faithful and hardworking and treat me right. And, and I want him to, to, to be a leader. And, and I want him to stand for the things of God. Well, wait a second. Whoa, whoa, stop, sister. All these things you're saying, you don't get that from a worldly punk. You understand that? You don't, they don't mix together. So you're, you're all scrambled up and confused. One woman says, I, I want an androgynous looking man. And, and, and she likes these little pop singers and, and all that. And you don't know if they're male or female. And she says, this is, a, this is attractive to me. It looks like a girl. Something's wrong with you. You've got, a long, you, you've got to fix whatever's wrong with you. You've got to talk to your mama about what you're eating or something. Because you are messed up. You want a bad man. But not too worldly. That's not, that's not how it works. You say, well, I just wanted to be a little bit edgy with the world. Is, hey, is that how sin works, brother? You just kind of mess with it a little bit? So your little fella here that you've got, oh, he, he's a little rebellious. He's a little edgy, but, you know, I kind of like it like that. Oh, that's where he's going to stay? That's where he's going to stay? Is that what sin does to you? You just waddle in a little bit and you can just stay right there on the edge of it? Is that how it was in your life, brother? No, you mess with it, you end up way down the road from where you thought you'd be. I'm just saying. You want a little rebellious fella, you wouldn't believe where he'll be. You backslide rapidly. I'm just trying to tell you, God's trying to do some things in you, perhaps. Or maybe God has some things to do for you to do. Maybe there's some things that you have to help your father with. Maybe there's a battle and some things you need to take care of. Maybe your church is in a situation where your church needs your help and your dedication right now. Maybe there's some people that need to be saved and some people that need to be discipled. There's a job to do. And God says, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to give you what you want, but you got to hold on a second. I got something for you to do for me. And I want you to serve in a special way dedicated to me right now. Then I'll let you serve that way. See, God's timing. Maybe God's working on the person that he has prepared for you. And when God brings the present to you, you're so excited to open it. You're like, oh, this is great. This is great. You got a present for me, God. This is so wonderful. And you open it up. Like, what is this? God says, it's a new you. I don't want a new me. God says, well, you're not going to be able to get the man you want until you're the new you. So you've got to be this new person. And, and, and listen, I got it. My blood paid for it. This is what I want you to walk in and become. This person right here. It's my gift to you. Maybe God brings you the person he's preparing. You ever see them little toddlers and all these little kids today? You know, they like to put them on the Internet where they have their little Christmas celebration or their birthday. And the little kid opens up his gift and then he starts screaming and cussing and saying things and throwing everything around and kicking a hole in the television and just just around the house. He says, I don't want it. I don't want it. I don't want this. And See, God doesn't want you to be a spoiled brat. He wants you to get in a situation where when God brings you your man, you're going to be very appreciative of it. God has to bring you to the right place. See, the world is working on you in more ways you will ever know. The world is saying, young lady, it's not going to call you a young lady, but you get the idea. The world wants you to like something that it has prepared for you. And I cannot believe how powerful the brainwashing is. I, ju I just can't believe it. I think every now and then they do a testing of it, you know. It is unbelievable the control they have to tell you 
what to like. This is the kind of man you should like. Let's consider Ecclesiastes 3, to everything there is a season and a time, to every purpose under the heaven. He hath made everything beautiful in his time. I know God is good. I don't understand the reason for his delays all the time. I don't understand the reason for the delays or the hardships and suffering in good people, some of the best people that you will ever, ever, ever meet in your life go through some of the hardest hardships. David says in Psalms 40, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined unto me and heard my cry. I like that because it shows that being patient doesn't mean that you're not crying out. It doesn't mean that you're not crying out the Psalms. and That's not a lack of patience. You're going to the right source. You're allowed to cry out to God and ask. In fact, he tells you to bring your supplication and your tears. But he waited patiently. I want to conclude tonight with a sweet story from a couple, a brother and sister hobby. Some friends that I believe the Lord has given great rare wisdom to, both of them. And they're a very dynamic, strong Christian witness. A couple of you have met the hobbies. They allowed me to read some of their story of how they were brought together. And uh, I'll read some of it for you tonight. She starts off by saying, thank you for that sermon on marriage. Thank you for praying for the single people. I have a special place in my heart for single people because I was definitely in that category while being called for marriage for a long time. God knew what he was doing with me. But I want to see people get married. I pray for our friends that have never been married and for the couples that I know that are struggling. She begins by discussing her husband before they were married. He came from a more secular, though also Christian home. He became more serious about Christianity in junior high. They started going to church regularly then. He implored his fellow band members to stop dating and focus on their goals. He was very goal-driven. He's an engineer. So in some ways, he's more interested in things than people. He had various artistic goals that he wanted to achieve, and he really wasn't interested in dating or getting married. He went through a time where he progressed into occult numerology and such. He didn't notice how much he had drifted. He had already formed a habit of avoiding women by the time that he was in that state. A few times, some women threw themselves at him, but he just refused. He just wasn't going there. Anyway, one day he was convicted from the book of Hebrews. He repented from drifting away from God, and God answered his prayers and showed him the truth of the word of the kingdom, starting with Lynn Mize. I grew up first. I grew up first on a farm and then on a Christian Bible camp in the middle of nowhere potentially more isolated than where you all are. I read I Kissed Dave, day, Dating Goodbye at age 15. I had no idea that anyone was interested in me anyway, so it was very easy, super easy to not date. Also, I lived 45 minutes from town. Also, I was a bit of a misfit. I wasn't uncool or cool. I just didn't fit in with anyone well. So I didn't have any real friends at school. So not dating was so easy. Summer was very friend-focused, but I was kind of the kid sister all of the time. I had some good convictions, but I also had some confusing solutions to accompany them. Now, I always wanted to get married and have children. I mean, I was daydreaming up plans to build a house and do all of this when I was five. I was hankering to get started. I hate procrastination. However, I could tell that I wasn't supposed to say that out loud. I mean, only losers want to just stay home and raise their kids, right? Sarcasm. Now, I do believe that women should be educated and that they should have goals, and I always knew that you have to think about taking care of yourself if you don't find a worthy partner. 
I was interested in becoming a missionary, and at 18 years of age, I was already working for a radio station. So I went to Bible college with the aim to get a communications degree, which changed to psychology just because that was the fastest route to completion at that time, and a Bible major while working at the radio station. Just prior to going to college, I had the conviction that God had a husband for me, but not at my college. That's the short story. Also, 90% of the boys at my college were obviously to me it was obvious anyway, immature addicts to porn and video games. There were also significantly more females than males at my college. I only lived on campus my freshman year, and to save money I rented a house a couple of blocks away with a few girlfriends after that. So I easily kept on not having a boyfriend or going on real dates. I think that I was 23 when I met a man that struggled with some deep issues that meant that he wasn't marriage material. But I think God sends me on missions to be a pest to people. I just had to be a pest to this man. I had to. Anyway, soon enough, we became close. We weren't romantic, but we entertained the idea for a minute because we were very much cared about one another. It just couldn't work. But God used us both to help each other, and that's how I learned about the word of the kingdom. And through a series of events, that's how I ended up in Florida. So that's how it was until 2010, perpetual singleness. I never had an actual boyfriend. I never kissed a boy or a man. And it was the month of my 27th birthday. The an annual kingdom conference was about to start. And I believed that God might just bring my future husband to it. I didn't want to make too much of that, but it was a pretty strong sense. It was strong enough that I asked my grandma to pray for it. It was persistent enough that I might have mentioned it to a couple of friends. Coincidentally, earlier in the day before the conference started in the evening, my female boss gave me an unusual compliment about my appearance, saying something like, girl, what are you going to do, meet your husband today? And I'm telling you, I really wanted to say yes, this is my hope, but I'm trying not to think about that. But I didn't dare say that, because what if I was wrong anyway? About one month prior to the conference, Kevin actually prayed that God would give him a wife if it was his will. He was just starting to warm up to the idea, grumbles. But he had kept himself pure in mind and body. I got put in charge of greeting people at the door, and that's when I met Kevin. Now, I did not immediately think that he was my future husband. I actually met someone else at the conference that gave me his number at the end of it. And we had a couple of phone conversations, but it just didn't seem like a good fit. He's married now, too, so that's great. But Arlen Chitwood and Lewis Shuttle, my publisher, kept nudging Kevin to go talk to me. And Kevin kept intentionally avoiding me because that was his unconscious habit for so many years. Finally, Lewis Shuttle, Kevin, and I were all in a room together at the same time, and Lewis made us talk to each other. If you know Lewis Shuttle, that's what he does. And there was another time that Arlen arranged for Kevin and me to start talking to each other. Anyway, I had a bit of a habit of inviting a few people over to my apartment wherever I was living that year during the conference. And so I told Kevin, and he was welcome to come join us. Kevin didn't have a vehicle in Florida. He flew there, so somebody gave him a ride, and I don't think I knew about that at the time. He said something to his friend about he planned to marry me. And his friend was like, hold the phone, what? Anyway, I really didn't want to stick my neck out for Kevin. I really wanted him to make any move that he was going to make. But I lost my cool a little, though. But it also saved the day. At the end of the evening, Kevin was openly giving out his email address, so I made it clear that I was writing it down, too. And I sent him an email on the spot saying something as brief as hi, and that was all. If I hadn't done that, we might not have ever got married. The dude was planning on marrying me, but he didn't have plans to actually make it happen. So ridiculous. Anyway... We started emailing back and forth, and it all happened really fast, and I knew what I was looking for, and I was confident that I had finally found it once Kevin started expressing his actual interest in me. We were married eight months later, had our first kiss on our wedding day. It did help that we dated long distance with just a few in-person visits that entire time. Also, we had a rough first year, and we learned how to do this marriage thing, but we made it through that embarrassing time of growth, and I'm grateful now that we went through it. We're messy people. But God has been so gracious to us. It's so good to know that our lives are about so much more than self. Self is miserable. Well, she's a gifted writer. There's more, but I can see why the Lord put that couple together. They are a great couple to teach the gospel, to teach people the 
kingdom accountability, and they minister everywhere they go and discuss the rewards and the truth of the kingdom, and they've been a great blessing. Let us go to God in prayer. Dear Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you, Lord, for your timing in that testimony that we just read and so many others, Lord. Now we pray, Father, that you will help people to seek your will and the beautiful things that you have for them to neither delay or be in a rash haste in a sinful way. We just pray for your blessing and your will, God. And now I pray you'll continue to bless this series in Jesus' holy name. Amen.